After viewing today's episode, if you like it, give us a thumbs up. Also, be sure to subscribe to the channel and visit our website at www.retroaxis.info where you can read more information about various topics as well as subscribe to our newsletter. The Sega Dreamcast is a sixth generation console that Sega had put out in an attempt to knock the Sony PlayStation out of its dominant position during that time. When launched, it was competing against other consoles such as the Nintendo 64, its own Sega Saturn, as well as the Atari Jaguar and several other machines of the day. The Dreamcast was quite innovative and today I'm going to walk you through some of the quirks and features of the console and then we're going to boot the NetBSD operating system and see how that runs. Let's take a look. The Sega Dreamcast was built around an Hitachi Super H or SH4 CPU operating at 200 megahertz. The main memory is 16 megs of SD RAM with other memory allocated for video and sound. The Dreamcast provides four input ports using a proprietary connection. On the back is an upgradable communications port with the US model shipping with a 56K dial-up modem. An optional broadband adapter was also made available and is installed on my unit here, which features a Realtek 10100 based Ethernet chip. Perhaps the most unusual feature of the Sega Dreamcast is its storage format. As graphics uh, and gameplay were becoming larger and requiring more space, console developers were looking for better ways to store data. Nintendo 64, of course, maintained the cartridge format, while as the Sony PlayStation used a CD format. The Sega Dreamcast opted for a new format made by Yamaha, a 12x speed GD-ROM, or gigabyte disc. To put in perspective, the DVD itself was on its horizon, so the Sony PlayStation 2 and the Xbox both chose to use DVD for storing their formats. A typical compact disc that was used in a PlayStation or a Sega Saturn holds 700 megabytes of space, whereas a DVD holds 4.7 gigs of space. However, the GD-ROM only holds one gigabyte of space. That's about five times less than a DVD. So from its very start, the Dreamcast already had a limited amount of space and options compared to the consoles that were shortly to launch thereafter. Another interesting thing about the Dreamcast is the Microsoft Windows CE logo printed on the front of the unit. This was an attempt by Sega and Microsoft to allow games written for Windows to be ported using the DirectX APIs directly onto the Dreamcast. Now my favorite feature of the Sega Dreamcast is by far the VMUs or the visual memory unit. And what's really unique about these was, um, you know, this was essentially a memory card that you would plug into the controller. And as you can see on the back, it has its own batteries that actually allows you to remove it and use it while it's disconnected from the controller. Once removed, the VMU itself contained its own D-pad and buttons. With the battery, you could use the VMU as a standalone portable game device. And several titles provided the ability to store a mini game onto the VMU that you can then take with you. Another cool feature was the ability to link your VMU to another, allowing you to copy save games or data between two VMUs without needing the actual console. And in some cases, there were two player uh, VMU games. The most unique feature of the VMU was the addition of an in-game screen that was unique to each player. When inserted into the controller, the VMU would act as a second screen, giving the player access to information literally at their fingertips. So this is one of my favorite games for the Dreamcast. It's called Wild Metal Country. It's actually a, a port of a game that I'd actually played on Windows. And, and what I really liked about this game, it's like sort of a, a tank uh, capture the flag style game. It's, it's really fun. I spent a lot of hours playing this particular game. Um, it's really a lot of fun. And uh, one of the other things that's really neat about it is as you start getting further into the game, they start introducing things like... Um, power generators where you have to blow up a power generator um, to to basically unblock a force field to get to a, a power a power up cube so you're actually going around collecting a series of these colored cubes and you see that one blinking right up there in the green uh, that's a cube that I need to go get and there's actually a, a turret that's launching 
more of a trebuchet, I guess. It, it's launching these these uh, depth charge barrels at me, and so I'm going to try to knock this guy out if I can. You can see he's shooting these barrels at me. But this is a great game, Wild Metal, one of the one of the better games that I, I've spent a lot of time playing on the Dreamcast, and um, I thought I would just you know show, take a moment just to show you this, and I, I hope you get a chance to check out this game. In the world where the consumer market was dominated primarily by the Intel processor, I used to have a lot of interest in things like Sun Microsystems, Spark processors, or MIPS processors that were used by SGI. The Super H processor in the Dreamcast is also a very interesting uh, piece of hardware. And there are projects out there like Linux and NetBSD that have ported their kernels. And um, one of the things I've always been interested in is can I run an alternative operating system on this hardware? As an example, the Linux kit for PlayStation 2 was actually made available by Sony, and it included a hard drive, a keyboard, and a mouse. Early revisions of the PlayStation 3 actually allowed you to boot your own operating system that was compatible for the PS3 until Sony later removed that capability. The Xbox, the original Xbox from Microsoft, uh, was hackable, and people were actually running Linux clusters and doing things like that. So I was also uh, very curious about the Dreamcast, and I was aware that NetBSD has ported um, you know, its operating system to the Dreamcast many years ago. But I was curious if it's been updated, if it still ran. So what I decided to do was uh, actually get NetBSD 8.0 running on my Dreamcast. So today I'm going to take you uh, very quickly through how I was able to get it to boot and uh, we'll, we'll take a look at the BSD operating system running on the Dreamcast. Let's have a look. To begin, I first installed a copy of NetBSD 8, the Intel AMD 64 version, on an available laptop. This allows me to have access to the toolset required in order to burn the NetBSD distribution more easily. There are other options available, but you can begin by looking at the how-to document provided by NetBSD in the Dreamcast port page. After completing the installation of my NetBSD laptop, I installed the DC-Tools package using the package source compile. After doing so, I now have a tool called DC-Burn-NetBSD. And the first thing you want to do is make sure that you know which versions of NetBSD are available to you. You simply issue a dash V with a question mark. And this will then pull the NetBSD website and look for the latest versions, or all available versions for that matter, of NetBSD that are available. In this case, I want version 8. I'm not going to use a snapshot or, or current or anything like that. So I'm going to now specify on the command line, I'm going to tell it that I want version 8. So we're going to run the DC burn dash NetBSD command dash V 8.0. I'm going to specify a dash L, which says that I want to create a live CD. Now this option is important as it will put all of the package sets, all the runtime files on the CD-ROM and allow you to run it live. This will be a bit of a performance hit as you will be having to access the disk every time you, you really do anything. So it, it will be a bit, of a, a bit slower than it would be if you were using an NFS server. Uh, to provide the distributions. The next thing will also be to issue the dash B, which says upon completion, go ahead and burn this. So when I hit enter, it's gonna begin downloading the necessary files for NetBSD 8, which includes the kernel and all of the sets required to run the system. When it's complete, it will then go ahead and use the CD record features that are available and burn the disk. With my disk ready, we'll now insert it into the Dreamcast. All right, now that the NetBSD disk is loaded, what we need to do is, is go ahead and go over to the play button and we'll press A and we're now going to watch it begin to boot. So it's gonna begin by resetting. And the reason the color is actually that pinkish color is, is, is not something wrong with your TV. It actually has to do with the way in which I'm passing my video through this HDMI um, to S-Cart um, um, adapter. It's for some reason the color is just, just a little bit off, but it is the clearest display that I can give you. Um, the, the RCA outputs is, is really very poor. So this is a much clearer uh, text view for you to read. Now, um, the other challenge that I have with this particular screen is, is it actually, um, because it's HDMI, it's actually cutting off the upper 
and lower portions of my screen. But I do know that the next thing I need to type is GD ROM zero and hit enter and then hit enter a few more times. And then um, it'll begin booting the, the system here. Okay, it's ready. Okay, so now my system is at the login prompt. So I will go ahead and type in root. There is no default password here. So it will take me straight into the system. I'll type the clear command as my first command just to show you. And you can see the access time is just abominable. It's just really very slow um, accessing everything off of the, off of the GD. Uh, but once it, it is a 12x GD. So if you can imagine, you know, back, back in the day when CD-ROMs were different speeds, I think 40x was, <laughs> I think, the maximum. So going down to 12x is actually quite slow. But here we are. We're actually loaded up. You can see I can run the ls command. I can run a D message and, and get a quick look at the, uh, the kernel output. Um, so we can see, you know, the devices. We could, uh, you know, parse this if we wished. Uh, I can run a uname. Actually, let's do that again typed it wrong just to show you here it is NetBSD uh, for Dreamcast and that's that's exactly what it's running so here you are NetBSD 8 on the Sega Dreamcast here we can see that it retrieved an IP address so networking is actually up I can actually log in to the NetBSD.org FTP server but because I'm running on a live CD, I don't think I have a whole lot of space available for me to actually do any writing. Uh, but we can we can indeed log in. And you can see we are actually using, uh, you know, various different programs here on, on the Dreamcast system. So earlier I was talking about the VMUs and the NetBSD version is, is no different. You can see right here that NetBSD uh, is shown right here. Uh, NetBSD Dreamcast right there on the VMU. So just a nice little touch there from the BSD team. So that's really it for this episode. Now, you know, I often wonder myself, you know, how useful is running NetBSD or another operating system on the Sega Dreamcast? To be honest, probably not terribly useful. Maybe there's some value that someone can derive from it. But to be honest, with only a 10100 based network adapter, a relatively slow processor, only 16 megs of RAM, I really don't see how you could do very much with this device in the modern day. So really nice that it's maintained, really cool that you know these guys were able to port this to the SH4 processor and actually get a full on Unix operating system running on the Dreamcast. So totally great work, amazing to see that, um, but the real value, probably not much there. But that's it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed it. Again, if you liked it, go ahead and give me a thumbs up, subscribe to the site, and visit us at www.retroaxis.info, and we'll see you next time. Take care.